Good morning. God has been good to us again in that he has granted us another opportunity. I don't say anymore in my vocabulary, oh man, I got to come to church. No, we get to come to church. We get to worship. We get to visit with brothers and sisters in Christ and sing songs and gather around the table all for the express purpose of doing one thing. Thank you, God, for your grace, for your richness, and for your mercy. Good morning, Trent. I'm glad to see you, those who are in person, as well as those who are worshiping with us through our live stream via social media. We recognize that you could have been other places this morning, but God put the intent in your heart for you to be here with us and to spend some time in worshiping and praising and saying thank you to the almighty God. To those who are worshiping with us in person, if this is your first time with us, please raise your hand. I got a gift I want to give to you. I want you to have just a little trinket, a little souvenir, um, just something to say thank you for making the trip to Trent and worshiping with us. And again, uh, Trent members, uh, again, I'm so impressed on our hospitality. Eric said good things um, about his recent visit here preaching in uh, my absence. And again, whenever we have a first time visitor, we always want to give them a memento, a souvenir, if you will, something to just say thank you for uh, coming and visiting with us in Trent. On the uh, prayer list this morning, I've added one other name. Please pray for Johnny Johnson um, and his family. If you're with us on our Sunday night devotionals that are online, Eunice is his wife. Sometimes Johnny will stick his head on the screen kind of sideways and just say hello. Um, Johnny's having some health concerns right now, and so let's pray for him. Eunice is my wife's sister, and then Johnny is, of course, her husband, as well as uh, April and Jamal Foster and all the other um, um, items that we have on our prayer list. Let's remember to pray one for another, but specifically these that we have on our prayer list. And if you're anything like me, as you're out and about and you're doing things in the community and people know that you come to church, or in my case, they know they know I preach, they'll stop. Hey, would you please pray for me? And in the past, you know, I'd say sure and go on about my day. And I hate to admit this, but I would forget that they uh, that they even asked me to pray for them. So what I do now, and, and I'm encouraging us to do the same thing. If somebody asks you to pray for them, instead of just giving them the answer, yes, I sure will. Stop right where you are. Say, absolutely. Do you mind if we take a minute and let's pray now? That'll do two things, at least in my experience, it's done two things. Number one, it'll show that you love them and you care about them and you're concerned enough to stop right where you are and pray for them. That's important. The secondary reason is you won't forget. <laughs> you won't forget when you get so busy and go about your day. So I'm hopeful and I'm prayerful that as we talk about these different things on the prayer list, in your everyday prayer life and your walk with God that you are you are praying for these people the minister to minister meeting will take place uh, this Wednesday March 27th at the uh, Odom Lane Church we normally meet at 8 30 in the morning and this is the ministers in the area it says ministers but there's some deacons that come there's some elders uh, that come there's some other church leaders that come and we meet once a month for the sole purpose of encouraging each other in the ministry and uh, others who want to uh, attend this with me I realize not everybody's able at 8 30 in the morning but you might just stop where you are if you're unable to attend and just pray for the ministry among the churches of Christ in our particular area especially among the rural churches we're all dealing with the same thing and that is none of the rural churches are getting any larger um, so we're all having to deal with the same thing so pray pray for us um, in the particular area and pray for the minister to minister meeting that will take place on Wednesday at the uh, Odom Lane Church. I think this week we're, or this month we're going to be talking uh, about how to deal with ministerial burnout, um, how some ministers have to cope and deal with the stress. Because um, I, I say this all the time and I'll get into the lesson in a minute. I say this all the time. 
um, we might make this look easy, but you only get to see the presentation of the 15 to 20 hours that we put in to, to, to coming up with this lesson. The, the, the presentation is easy. Living this out and everything else that goes along with ministry, that's the hard part. So I say all that to say, y'all not only pray for your preacher, pray for all preachers uh, among the Lord's church because this is really not as easy as we perhaps make it seem. Our gospel revival, our gospel meeting will take place April the 17th through the 19th. Brother Freddie Anderson will be here. Um, and he to say he is excited um, is, is beyond, beyond words. Brother Freddie is looking forward to coming back and being with us and sharing and preaching the gospel. Now, he is going to do his part in delivering the message of God. We must do our part in inviting people to come and to hear the message. Those of us in our online audience, um, we encourage you to take part in our live stream. Share our link with other people that you know that could benefit from these series of, of meetings. Brother Anderson is going to be here. We're going to start that meeting at 7 o'clock um, every night. That will be Wednesday Thursday and Friday and so this is our gospel meeting this is what we need to do to invite people here so make sure that you 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 share this on social media share it on Facebook or X or whatever your social media platform please take one of the invitations um, that's back there take a picture of it with your phone and share this on your social media platform as well as in the community there are some cards back there there are some flyers we we have to talk up our meeting and invite people to come to the gospel revival. He's going to talk about faith, family, and friends, how to let your light shine regardless of your situation, regardless of your stress, and regardless of your struggle. So that'll be 7 p.m. Wednesday through Friday. In conjunction with that, um, Tangina wants to meet with the ladies up front for a few moments, make some planning um, in regards to the uh, the gospel meeting. I want to meet with the men in the back for about five minutes while the ladies are meeting up front. Men, join me in the back. Got some information that, that I want to give you. Bill and your guests, please come on back with us for about five minutes after um, words so we can, we can talk about some things as we get ready. We get ready for the gospel meeting. This month I'm calling the series March Madness, How to Find Merriment <clears throat> in the Midst of Mayhem. And I'm saying there, looking at the scripture of Psalm 34, it is complete madness to think that you can live your life absent from a relationship with God. Yes, that is a play on words, but it's also an effective play on words because while, while we try to do things on our own, when the calamities of life come our way, it doesn't take long. Like we, we saw in the book of Joshua, this morning, it doesn't take long to realize you need God. And I need God. I don't know what it is about us that we try to do things on our own and we break the toy and then we come to God with all the broken pieces and demand that he fix it. And when he doesn't fix it the way we think or according to our satisfaction, we get mad with God. What I'm saying this month in these sermons is quite simple. In the madness let's live our lives in connection with God, do what he says and how he says to do it. And Psalm 34 is a great place to look when it comes to how to have a relationship with God and still live life subject to him. Let's talk about Psalm 34, how we as people ought to be prepared in our, in our walk with him, how to live our lives and, and live according to what, what, what we want to do, but at the same time in submission to God's word and God's will. Pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. Thank you for the opportunity we have now to open your word and to lay bare before you our hearts, our minds, and our souls, and just to hear how you want us to live our lives. You've blessed us, Father, and we recognize that, we acknowledge that, but we also acknowledge apart from you, absent from you, we can do absolutely nothing. Bless the word, Father, that it find a resting place in our hearts and 
Help us to listen and obey your word and hear what you want us to do and how you want us to live our lives so that we can let our light shine in a world of darkness. Forgive us of our sins. Bless those who are struggling and hurting and help us to be able to minister to those as you would see fit through our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 34 is really a psalm about how to live a victorious life. And, and really, David was on the run when he was writing these words. And I'm breaking this up in the sections that I'm dealing with every week. And can you imagine against the backdrop of running from somebody who's crazy and you did nothing wrong, now you're going to encourage other people on how to live a victorious life. Verse 11 the psalmist says, come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, he's saying here, here's how you do it. Here's how you end the madness. Here's how you find the, the merriment in the midst of mayhem. This is how you do it right here. Keep, keep your tongue from evil, oh Lord, <laughs> and your lips from telling lies, oh Lord, again. <laughs> Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You really want to know how to, how to find merriment in the midst of mayhem. See, we live in a culture that's so selfish and so selfish in me and what I think and it's all about me. The first step we got to do to end this madness is really come out and give God his props. Give God his due because apart and absent from God, we can do nothing. This psalm is a picture of how to live victoriously. This psalm is, is really a good snapshot that really tells us this is how God wants you to live your life. And the choice and the practice for this is up to you. When you were in school, would it have made any difference as you took those tests in school? Would it have made any difference if you had the answers to the test before you took the test? Now, in my day, in, in my day, they, 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 called it, they called it cheating, okay? <laughs> That, I don't know if it's changed now. I don't. Teachers, calm down, teachers, calm down. But, but in my day, in my day, they called, it, they called it cheating. We discovered a long time ago, if you got the teacher's edition of the subject book, so y'all might not know this, let me just tell you. The teacher's edition in the back, it's got the answers. Now, don't ask me how I know, because I'm not going to tell you. Okay, I'm not going to tell you. But would that have made a difference? Again, you look at Psalm 34. Psalm 34 is kind of like having the answers to the test before you even take the test. Because 13, verse 13 and verse 14 tell you exactly how to end this madness. But you know the tough part of this, and we'll get to this in a minute. You know the tough part about it? We can read the answers and we can have the answers. <clears throat> but the challenge to that is actually doing what it says, when the madness of life metastasizes, we can have confidence that we serve a God who is able to miraculously de deliver those of us that trust him. God has already given us the answers. We already know what to do when life gets crazy. That's not the problem. The knowledge is not the problem. It's the execution, isn't it? it, it it's doing it is actually executing it. I remember the first F that I got, and never will forget this. It was in math at, in school at ACU in college. And, you know, talk about seeing a 27, 28 year old man cry um, was an understatement. I never will forget. Harry, Harry knows her, um, Professor Helen Towell. I think she's at Odom Lane now, but she was a math teacher. And uh, I went to see her in her office, and uh, I was just crying. And she just, hand to God, true story, she gave me a tissue and said, it's okay, it's okay. 
what you need to do is take the course again and your problem wasn't the knowledge see you're older than most everybody else in the class except her and she really said this you haven't seen this these guys just saw it weeks ago you haven't seen this for years so what I suggest that you do is when you take the class again keep all of your notes and study ahead so that you can execute what you know now is coming and she said some students decide to take another teacher maybe that'll click with them and I looked right at her and said Miss Tao why, why do I want to take another teacher I already know you <laughs> I already know how you gonna give me a test so I took the took the class again I think I made a B I didn't make an A but uh, but I made a B but I learned something valuable in in that in that in that lesson you know failure is not final it's not Failure is not fine. And just because you don't pass something or you aren't successful the first time doesn't mean that you don't back up, regroup, and try it again. That's Psalm 34. That's where we're going here. Let me give you four things that I think as you want to end the, the, the madness and you want to find merriment in the midst of this chaos that's in your life, let me give you four things from Psalm 34 that might help you. They all start with the letter L. Number one, there's a lesson to be learned. We got to live life fearing the Lord. Now, not fear and trembling, fear meaning a healthy respect. We, we, got, to, we got to live our lives kind of like the way we were raised. We had to have a healthy respect for those that were older than us. Back when I was coming along, and it wasn't that long ago, don't y'all bother me, okay? But when I was coming along, it was disrespectful not to say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. These days now, I've, I've met kids, not nobody here, but these days I've met kids that call me by my first name. And, and they, you know, they might be eight, nine years old, and I'm well past 60. But, uh, you know, they call me, hey, Freddie. And I'm like, ooh, but I just, I don't say nothing. I just leave it alone. We've got to have a healthy respect. Let me just put a side note. If I'd have done that, my mother's name was Sally. Sally's hand would have been on me quicker than you can blink but it's a different world right now what's the lesson we got to have a healthy respect when it comes to God we've got to have this this awe and this fear and this respect to say Lord you are sovereign Lord you are supreme and I'm gonna live my life in total dedication to you Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 I like from the King James Version Paul says and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and the ammunition of the Lord. Raise your children, fathers and mothers, with a healthy respect of who God is in their lives. And in, when you do that in your life, then you won't have any fear. Now, what do I mean by that, no fear? The idea is I'll have a healthy respect for God, and when I mess up, it won't be like the relationship that perhaps some of us may have had with our dad where God, we see God like we see our dad and he's got a belt and he's ready to get us. That's not God. But there is a healthy respect. I have a healthy respect for God and for his word. God's word says it. I don't question it. I do what I can to put my life in congruence with God's word. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I love the word in verse 2, honor. You got to show honor to your father and your mother. It wasn't until mom's passed on now, you all know that, but it wasn't until a few years ago that I even had a more healthy respect for my mother. You know, all that she did for us and denying herself and things that she wanted to do, she put that on the back burner for the sake of her children. I honor that. I respect that. And there were a couple of times I had to go home and re remind one of my sisters, you need to show more honor or you're going to find your brother's rat. No, I'm kidding. I'm not. But I'm really not kidding. We need to show more honor and more respect. I love the, the text. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may, be go well, it may go well with you and that you may enjoy children long life 
on this earth. Children, you want to cut your life short? Disrespect your mom and dad. It might not get you right when you see it, but you wonder why with some kids certain things don't work out. They, the, the car always breaking down. They, 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 they always don't have enough money. There's always a problem. Trace that back to how have you been respecting your mother and your father. You need to live your life with a healthy fear, respect for God. Then the third one, I said, oh, Lord. I said two, oh, Lords. This is the first of the two, oh, Lords. We got to watch our lips. <laughs> we got to watch what we say. We got to watch how we well, handle our tongue and, and what words come out of our mouth. He says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Deceit simply means falsehoods. And a lot of times we'll, we'll get what, what old folk used to call diarrhea of the mouth and, and all under the guise of, well, I didn't really mean it. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. What you meant to say was you didn't mean for nobody else to hear it. That's what you meant. You know, we need to really, seriously, in all seriousness, we need to do a better job as people of watching our tongue and making sure that whatever we speak gives glory and honor to God. Ephesians 4.29, it steps right on my toes too. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for the building up, for the building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. If I don't have anything nice to say, then what? Say nothing at all. That's, a, that's something, a lesson that we all need to learn. And I understand, and we always use this excuse, well, it's human nature, and I'm, I'm only human. To that I say, we still need to try. We still need to be proactive. We still need to take the right action and say, you know what? That was ugly, and I shouldn't have said that, and I apologize. Would you forgive me, and I'll try to do better next time. We do as Christians need to do a better job because even our speech, our language, our thought, everything that, that, that exudes from us needs to be in the image of Christ. And then... I'll wrap this up. The litmus test, I love verse 14. See, if you make a stab at doing all of this from 11, verse 11 to verse 13, then the litmus test, the proof of it is verse number 14. And we got to be Christ-like in our actions, and those got to manifest in the midst of us living our lives. We got to be deliberate, and we got to be intentional in our our godly lives. Look at verse 14. I want to I want to unpack verse 14 and then I'm then I'm done. Look at how deliberate and how action oriented verse 14 is. Now, I hadn't noticed this uh, up until a couple of weeks ago as I was really doing a deep dive for this lesson. Look at verse 14 and see how it takes action on the part of us to make all of this happen. Number 1, he says Turn from evil. That's a deliberate action. Now, some of us misread this text, and you misread it thinking turn to evil. That's not what it says. Okay? Turn from evil. That's a deliberate action. What does that look like? If evil is right here, I need to go this way. But that's not some of us. Some of us, evil is this way, and we go and we give it a big old bear hug. We shouldn't do that. Why? Because if we're going to be believers and children of God, we got to do what the Bible says. Shun the very presence of evil. If evil is right here, I got to turn and I got to go this way. Secondly, David says in, in verse 14, do good, not bad. And, you know, we, we think that's such a simple, we, we treat that like such a simple thing. But do you know how many people refuse to do good how many people refuse to do good and they revel in actually doing bad and i call the good samaritan the, the parable of the good samaritan to the witness stand all three of those characters 
They thought they were doing good by passing over and going to the other side. It wasn't until the Samaritan came along that he took action. He did good and he went the extra mile. He, he helped the man. He dressed him. He put him on his own beast and he took him to the hotel. I said this one of the Wednesday nights and he must have had good credit because after he went to the shopkeeper, he said, hey, whatever you spend extra, my credit is good. When I come back, I'll pay you. <laughs> he must have had good credit. So Christians, we need to keep good. No, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm stop. We need to do good instead of doing. Somebody said, Brother Amber, leave me alone. Okay, I ain't bothering you. We need to do good instead of doing bad. And then we need to seek peace, not chaos, and pursue it. You ever known some people? I got two friends in my life. If things aren't going bad, they're not happy. If chaos isn't ensued, they're not happy. I got some friends that really love mess. You got any friends like that? I got two, okay? I, I got some friends, they really love, and the messier the mess, the better. I'm like, that's too exhausting, get away from me. But we as Christians, we as believers, we need to seek peace. How do, how, how do people know you in your life, at work, in the community, uh, in your circle of influence? Do people know you as a person of peace or do they know you as the instigator of chaos? If that's true, then today is the chance that you can make a change and we need to actively pursue peace. That's why this, this month um, I'm saying we need to be deliberate. We need to take action and not react, but we need to be deliberate. Last scripture, I love this one in Titus chapter two. How do you do that? I always try to answer, what does that look like and how do I do that? Brother Fambal, I've heard you and I hear the word, but so what? What does that mean? How do I wrap my arms around this? Titus chapter 2 tells us how to do it. For the grace of God that has appeared, that offers salvation to all people, it's appeared. It's here. Verse 12, it teaches us that denying ungodliness, and I like this from the King James, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There's how you do it. We got to live in such a way that our life tells the story without us even having to open the Bible one single time. We say no to ungodliness and worldly passions to live self-controlled and upright godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love this quote by uh, Billy Graham, and it's, it's talking about submission and how we should submit our lives to God. He says, submission involves getting rid of everything which hinders God's control in my life. And that's, that, that's simple, isn't it? And that's my job. That's our job. We ought to get rid of everything in our life that hinders God's control in our very lives. Join me tonight online. If I don't have your email address, give it to me before you leave and I'll send you a link and we'll have a 15, 20 minute devotional. And we're talking about tonight the book of Psalms. We're, we're taking a stroll through Psalms and, and really dealing with Psalms that help us to deal with with having to live righteously um, and right living. And so maybe that'll help you tonight. The invitation time is a time of self-evaluation. It's a time for us to really look at our lives against the mirror, the backdrop of God's word. And if there's anything in our lives that we are doing deliberately that is hindering our submission to God, we need to get rid of it. We need to have the courage to come forward and say, I, I renounce it. I'm going to do better this week than I did last week. Maybe you have a Bible question that you want answered, or maybe you're dealing with something and, and you want prayer in that particular instance, or maybe you want to begin your walk with God and you just really biblically don't know how to do that. Listen, everybody who has come to God in the New Testament has come to God the same way. They've heard the gospel, believed it, repented of their sins, confessed Christ, and being willing to be baptized in water for the remission of their sins. And from that watery grave of baptism, they've risen up to walk, Paul says, in a new life or in the newness of life. Together, we will encourage each other from that point on until Christ calls us 
from labor to reward. If you have a prayer need, if you, if you have a Bible question, or if in fact you want to study more about what it takes to become a Christian and to be baptized, or maybe you want to be baptized today, we ask you now to come as we stand and sing the song of invitation.